Okay. So where were we? How did you like that reading? No complaints? You liked it? Well, it was short and it was accessible. Um, so I understand on those perspectives. Um, does anyone feel traumatized? Is everyone okay? If, if you're having trouble, uh, the counseling center is there for you. Your friends are there for you. And uh, uh, we need to take care of each other because we can't afford to uh, stay in bed, which the intended outcome of this is to not depress you, not to add to your already uh, all the reasons for you to be depressed and all the reasons for you to just stay in bed. It actually, uh, the intention here is to energize and activate you uh, as warriors uh, in the fight for the future of humanity and the planet. Uh, I don't know if it's working. Um, you can let me know uh, as we go along uh, if that's working. Um, because uh, it's part of, the, the premise for this goes back to what I said uh, at least twice. You guys are the f world's foremost experts on your own life experience. And you need to bring that to work every day. You need to bring it to school every day. We cannot afford you sitting back and passively uh, taking in the given understandings that your, your schooling uh, offers you. Your schooling is one thing, and your education is another. You're paying for your schooling. I'm offering you schooling. But I feel obligated to point out that what we offer is not even close to sufficient for the task. Sorry about that, but just deal with it. It's kind of like death. We're all going to die someday. Uh, the planet is in trouble. And your schooling is insufficient to the task of addressing those things. Sorry. But it's best we acknowledge it right now. We should have, this should have been part of kindergarten. But uh, better late than never. So if your schooling is not sufficient, what then must we do? Well, fortunately, your education is much bigger than your schooling. Your education, uh, I'm trying to help your education, but I can't do it. You can't trust me to do it. You can't trust your professors to take responsibility for this. You cannot trust your university, your schooling, your parents. The world will not take care of your education. You have to take care of your education. It is your job. Sorry, it's your job. We bring you, we bring you as far as we can, and on a good day, we get you this far, right? Your schooling can bring you as far as you can, but the world needs you to do this, and you need to do this. This is, this is, your, this is your part. When I took the History of Architecture course in my undergraduate program, uh, the first course was very strong. I really loved it. But then the second course, uh, it was all about the 20th century. Pathetic. I was really disappointed in the quality of the course. So I bought a book, uh, I bought, and then I bought three more books. And I read, and I read, and I read. And um, I, that's how I learned the history of architecture in the 20th century. And son of a gun, now I'm teaching it, right? I'm not teaching you the stuff I learned in school. I'm teaching you the stuff that came from this part of my education, the part where I had to go get it, I had to grab it. And you know what? Even here in this classroom, you gotta go get it, you gotta grab it. Even though this is a lecture, and like I said, I'm number four, and I'm gonna number four the hell out of uh, the topic every Friday, that's not enough. It's not enough to physically be here. Uh, it's not enough to just attend. Uh, attendance is not enough. You have to attend to. So 
the attitude you took in the aggressive, active reading of this Anthropocene thing is the same attitude you should take towards this lecture. Like you should be attacking this lecture from the seated, seated position. When you hear something that you don't understand, you ask a question. When you hear something that uh, you, it doesn't, it's not convincing, ask a question. And uh, the third kind of question, right, there are three kinds of questions that we talked about in the uh, sketch writing assignment. There's, what does that mean? Really, is that, uh, is that really a, uh, a justifiable position to take? And what if? The third question is what if. Save your what if, maybe jot it in your notes, and I hope you take notes, um, because this, there's a lot to take in. You should take notes in the manner of sketch writing during the lecture as well. It should be a habit that you uh, take on. Uh, but the first two types of questions, what does that mean? And uh, uh, really, uh, I'm not sure the evidence supports that assertion that you're making, okay? So, um, so how about that sketch writing? How did that go? Do you have any questions about the mechanics of it? Um, everybody read those, those complex nine easy steps in the instructions uh, in the syllabus and then followed the example? No questions? Yes? Um, if you, uh, so I'm going to answer that by describing the functional reason for the page numbers. So this, your, your sketch writing is like a time machine. It's like a time capsule. You are writing a message to your future self. In the future, uh, you're going to need to pull together very quickly a bunch of stuff and, and digest it. Uh, and present it to other people. Uh, and that could be happening as early as Monday, uh, for example. Uh, and so the tradition of anyone who's gone to college, anyone who's educated, the tradition when you do that is to not just do that, but also say, this information is coming from Roy Scranton's uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene page four. Uh, and so in order to do that without wasting a lot of time going back uh, in history, like, do you, are you going to hold on to that? Did you print it out? Are you going to hold on to that photocopy forever? Maybe, maybe not, but probably uh, your sketch writing is something that you should take ownership of. You should hold on to it. And if the page locations are there, you can just, boom, page four. Um, and refer to it. So you have, so that's, that's the purpose of this. So every bullet point. So f more frequently than you think. And I'm not sure, did the example do it every bullet point or not? No, that's why I was confused. It was like yeah. Sporadic. Yeah, uh, it's hard to find an example, and even that example, I had to manipulate and alter and push and push and push, because it's hard, it's hard for uh, students to do it well enough to serve as, an, as a true example. And so you've pointed out something. I'll try to fix that before next year. Or maybe one of you will uh, do the sketch writing so well that it will end up being my example for my graduate students next fall. Other questions about the mechanics of the sketch, sketch writing? What are the steps? It's uh, make an outline. That's clear. Uh, speculate on what you might dare to hope to get out of it uh, in the form of a question or two or three. That's OK. And then what's the third one? Paraphrase. And um, so really, it should say capture. 
identify the stuff that matters most and capture it as best you can. The tendency is to overquote because that's easier. It's easier to just copy and paste the text into your sketch writing. But that's, that's, um, that's leaving that content unprocessed. A much better habit to get into is to read a paragraph and paraphrase it in a sentence. Read a page and paraphrase it into a sentence or two. Read a whole subheading or a whole section, a whole segment, and paraphrase it as concisely as you can. And uh, typically, if you're uh, enthusiastically and aggressively engaging it, you can write a better sentence uh, to communicate the content for yourself than uh, if you quoted the entire piece from the author's writing. Does that make sense? Because in the heat of the moment when the world and your team, your project team, needs you to come up with that content, it's best if you've already pre-processed it as you actively engage it uh, in the first reading of it. And I suspect your project team is going to want to know what you got out of this reading uh, 10, 15 years from now. So hang on to this, because uh, this is money in the bank. This is part of the assets, asset value you are investing in, in the schooling part of your education. Um, so there's paraphrasing. And then there's a very important one after that. The next one is ignore, right? Is that OK? When's the last time your teacher encouraged you to ignore part of the assignment? Has that ever happened? I might have done it last summer. But in part because you are responsible for your education and you can't afford to turn yourself over to your school, uh, it is fundamentally important that you ignore things that don't matter. Because this is part of you taking ownership of your expertise. You are the world's foremost expert on your own life experience. You cannot afford, we cannot afford for you to not hold on to that. Hold on to who you are, what you know, what you understand, what your lived experience is. The world needs that. And if your lived experience tells you, I don't care about this part, I don't care about this point, uh, or if your lived experience tells you, um, listen, I don't have time for this. Epistemological hegemonic regime, I don't care, I'm not gonna look up what that means. That's just jargon. It's just too heavy of a lift for me to go to the internet Look up each of those words, epistemology. Oh, now I have to look up epistem as opposed to ontological. I, I don't have time for this, right? That's a reasonable position for you to take because you are an agent of your own education. You don't have time for this. You gotta, you gotta move on to other things. So speaking of which, so ignore is a crucial component of this. This is you taking ownership of your life, of your education, of your place in the world. How long did this assignment take you? Um, how long? An hour. Hour? Two hours. Two an hour. hour. You read it before. <laughs> two. Two. OK, we got one or two hours. Raise your hand if it took you one or two hours. Did it take you longer than two hours? Who did it take longer than two hours? Um, that's OK. Right? Did, was it worth it? Was it worth the one or two hours? It's a legitimate uh, position for you to take. Uh, this one, I think, is worth it. It's short. It's a, big, it's a big payoff for not a huge amount of effort. That's not always going to be the case. And sorry, but part of the reason why we do this sketch writing is so I can give you uh, a reading that is 40 pages long only some of which is valuable. And 
you are prepared and you are trained and you are responsible for tackling those 40 pages in an aggressive, very selective way because you are agents of your own education. I, would, I expect you, when you get a 40 page reading from me or somebody else, I want you to go in there, quickly uh, capture the outline, the structure of ideas, and then ask yourself, is this worth my time? And if the answer is yes, what, why is it worth my time? What can I possibly gain from, this, from the investment it's going to take in these 40 pages? And capture that in a question or two. And then armed with that, you go in, you get what you need, you grab anything else you encounter along the way, and you get out. Have you heard the burglar analogy of higher education? Burglar? You heard this? So, in the burglar analogy of higher education, you've broken into an extremely wealthy person's home. Like, that's college, right? There's a lot of valuables in there. But in the process, you triggered the burglar alarm. The police are on their way, right? You don't have all the time in the world. In the college analogy, you have four years, right? And then you're out. You don't have all the time in the world. So what do you do? There's a plasma screen TV on, on the wall, or a, 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 there's a 4K, 4K high def, huge uh, TV on the wall, and you've always wanted one of those. Do you, take, do you take the TV? No. You don't have all the time in the world. Um, save it for the master's program. Right? You go for the jewels. You go for the cash. You go for the small electronics and anything else you encounter along the way. And you get the hell out of there. Because the police are on the way. You can hear the sirens. Right? Same thing with your four-year education. Same thing with each assignment. When I give you a 40-page reading, uh, do you read the whole thing from start to finish, word by word, as if it were a Stephen King novel? No way. You go in, you decide what you want out of it, you go in, you grab the valuable stuff, you stuff it in your pockets, and you get the hell out of there. You give it, you decide how much time you're going to give it, and you set a timer, and that's what you give it. So um, the proper attitude when you start an assignment like this is you should be uh, very protective of your time and effort and attention. You should be a little pissed off that you got this 40-page assignment. And you should harness that emotion uh, in and use it to get you to be aggressive and active in, uh, and not slip into the passive mode where you're just reading word after word from the beginning to the end, and whatever sticks, sticks. Same thing with these lectures, right? Uh, be, be actively engaged and question things when they come up. OK, so that's outline, target, paraphrase, ignore, question, question, question. Three types of questions, at least. What does that mean? Really? And what if? And then you start to connect things. Oh, this reminds me of what I learned uh, in Ingrid Strong's class uh, when she was talking about this thing that time. Uh, and then you extend. You say, well, if this thinking is applied to the realm of fill in the blank, what, what would the implications be? So you're speculating on the possibilities of extending this thinking into a new realm. And then you take a break, uh, to clear your head, um, so you're not hypnotized by your own sketch writing. And then you treat your sketch writing as if it is a source reading in and of itself. And you go through and you critically evaluate. You very selectively say, yeah, these points are, are interesting, but they're not that important. Now, but this point, this point is important. And this point, and on a good day, there are three or four points that are important. And, but still, it's a little heavy to carry all those three or four points. And so you summarize the takeaway. So what is the takeaway from this reading? Uh, you try to capture it in a sentence. 
and then you write that at the very top. Did that work? Were you able to do all that? Let's share them. Let's share the takeaway sentences and help each other out. Right? I'm not grading you on this exercise, but if you can um, uh, access that sentence, let's, um, <coughs> let's share them. So who wants to start? <coughs> OK, Justin. I saw uh, when dealing with climate change and the future of humanity, Scranton urges us to first look into ourselves and find acceptance that we are facing our end and understand that in order to live in our changed world, we must change what it means to be human. Wow. That's good. You like that? Yeah. I'm going to write that down. OK, let's go that way, Connor. Uh, mine was shorter. Uh, I wrote, in a world that has been poisoned by its own inhabitants, many still refuse to face the planets and their own imminent death. And in fact, they are already dead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Olivia. I said, although every day we might wake up thinking the changes we are making are helping the environment and that we will find a solution for climate change, we should actually be accepting the fact that we have caused permanent damage to the earth and climate change will kill us all. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's Kira? Yeah. Um, the writer encourages the um, humanity to defend themselves with um, a war, a war in the world against the forces of planetary death. Yeah, exactly. Star Wars. Okay. And your is about is is how do people what do people call you? Isabel. Isabel. Okay. Uh, I said everything happens in the world. And even how to die, war, screens and urges us to be integral. In the deepest existential sense. Okay. All right, Xavier. What do you well, in the planning of future civilization, we must consider the outcomes of our actions when the outcome is our death. Scranton believes that once we are comfortable with the understanding that we are already dead as a whole, we are more able to understand Yeah, that's more helpful than Olivia's. Like, it's supposed to. <laughs> get us to, to do stuff, right? That's not how I interpreted it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we two should talk. <laughs> Austria. Did I, what? Damar. Where's Austria? That's why I'm confused. Okay, I'm going to need to hear, because I didn't quite hear it. I wasn't Oh, okay. How do you say it? Tamara. Tamara. T A M A R A. Tamara. Or you can say it. I can say it in American? Tamara. Damn. Tamara. Everyone says it differently. I could also say Tamara. Is that pretty good? Yeah, it is pretty good. I'm auditioning for the person. Someday I want to grow up and be the person who announces your names at graduation with proper respect. So your parents don't go, oh my god, right? <coughs> so, Tamara, what, is, what did you get? You what? Oh, who's your buddy? Yeah, but who's your buddy? <laughs> so, are you going to help her out? Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, wait. Let's. Okay. Well, 
Where you got? Oh, uh, unfortunately, like, uh, I didn't get the point of the takeaway. So you didn't get the what? The point of the takeaway. Oh, so. do you want to take a shot? <laughs> Did you read it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can improvise. The world often calls upon us as professionals to improvise on the spot. So, are you up up to it? No, no, Maybe I should think more about it. Okay. Cooper. Uh, <clears throat> when facing challenging situations, accepting the harsh truths is an important step towards creating a solution. Okay. That has lasting impact. Okay. That's optimistic. <laughs> I want to live in that world. <laughs> Talk to Olivia. Okay, Will. Um, granted, urges us as a society to envision the damages of climate change as existing today in order to establish the mentality that we are already dead to prompt society to focus on what needs to be done to solve the problem rather than continuing our unsustainable way of life. Yeah, we're already dead. It's not about us. Kind of, right? Are you Aiden? Yep. Okay, Aiden. As a human species begins to affect the world as a geological force with man-made and natural disasters, Strand informs us that we must accept that our world will die before any true change or adaptation can occur. Yeah, okay. I don't know your name. Bradley. Bradley. Yeah. The okay. efforts to change our planet's situation come at the cost and time of failure. We have ignored the problem. Ah. Okay. Matt. In order to survive climate change, we and our society must adapt to it. Okay. David. The imminent death that we all face is climate change that dwells in the era of the Anthropocene and the solution for this problem is intangible, but the realization that civilization is dead. Aw. Uh -huh. Michael. Uh, Scranton wants us, urges us to think about um, <coughs> humans on this earth that are driving ourselves into the future and the past. Okay. And you are... Jake? Yeah. Jake. Uh, climate change has been a known issue, issue for years now, but continuing to undermine the damage done has put humans in a position to anticipate their own demise. Huh. And you so, are? Danrick. Oh, Danrick. Oh, Danrick. Danrick. I'm going to have to work on that one. <coughs> OK. Oh, Danrick. And the faith? In the face of climate change, we have to realize that civilization is over. Expressing the uncomfortable truth, <laughs> expressing the uncomfortable truth to urge us to accept that it is inevitable will help us better prepare for the upcoming disasters. Okay. Z. I said, with the current climate conditions that we as a society have brought upon ourselves, we must learn and design for the world, not by reversing its effects, but by adapting and mitigating. Okay. We, although reversal would be fun. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. <laughs> All right. Faisal. Um, in order to save the next generations, we need to learn how to face an animal's death. We need to expect it and be ready for it every day. Wow. Okay. Kai? <coughs> The effort of seeing age has begun. The human created climate has dominated the world, and the only solution is to mitigate the damage that's already been foretaken. The greatest threat to civilization will ultimately, will ultimately be our own demise. We control our own destiny, and when confronting the face of death, we must accept it. When we embrace that, only can we find more time to fix our wrongs in the world. <coughs> okay. And you are. Chair? No. Chris, Chris. take off that hood. <laughs> oh, Chris! <laughs> in order to face the limits of humanity, we must first come to terms with how our current actions will affect us in the future. Once we realize that our actions has set us up for failure, and once we realize that our actions have set us up for failure as a human race, we will understand that in order to change our future, we must learn. We must first understand as humans that we will. That we will inevitably face a horrible environment. Uh, okay. J. 
Jared? Yes. Um, due to continued mistreatment, mistreatment of our planet, the human species must accept its fate of death and begin to begin learning to adapt and survive the possible future conditions. So um, some of these are long, like three sentences, and some of them are short. Which which is better, long or short? It's how you use it. Yeah, no preference. It's entirely how you use it. It's definitely short. Short, um, short is handier, and on a good day, short we get we get to short, but. You have to get the content in there, so rather than create an artificially constructed uh, run-on sentence to get the content in there, it's better to break it into two sentences. So plan A, one sentence that nails it. Plan B, it nails it in whatever length you have to do it. Plan C, uh, it doesn't quite capture the, the point, right? That's unacceptable. You got to capture the point because you're going to need this. This is, like, this is like having a Swiss Army knife. You're building your Swiss Army knife. You need it in your pocket uh, for your professional success, right? You need to know that the samurai warrior spirit that uh, uh, has been written about for over a thousand years is something on the minds of US soldiers in Iraq and is about to be part of the next global conflagration uh, of war that consumes the youth of uh, the country. Um, it used to be in the 60s and 70s, we would say these warriors are war criminals and we would protest them, but we don't do that anymore. We recognize that the main thing that these warriors are doing is they are protecting each other. And it is heroic in and of itself, regardless of the corrupt intentions of US leadership, right? It doesn't matter uh, what criminal activity the US government is engaged in through the bodies uh, and deaths of these and the killing machines that they've trained, these uh, young warriors are in there to save each other's lives or prolong each other's lives. They're there to save each other, even if it means sacrificing their own deaths. That is an amazing mindset. It's an amazingly powerful mindset, right? And it is the kind of powerful mindset that is available to us as we engage in facing the challenges of uh, global climate change. It changes everything. Global climate change changes everything, right? So anything else about um, Scranton right now before I hop into the lecture? Okay. So if you're not taking notes on your laptop, please close your laptop. And I'm going to walk. You remember last summer how I used to walk around and embarrass people? I hate that. Don't you hate it when I do that? Well, what do you think? How do you, how do, how do you think I feel? I hate doing that. OK. So given the urgency of the professional challenges that you are facing in, during your lifetimes and your careers, what, is it OK for your faculty to teach you the same old, same old history of architecture, history of urbanism, <coughs> the same way it was taught to us uh, a whole century, the last, the last millennium, right? Uh, and so you'll notice that um, the first lecture is labeled 11, and it and it's, deals with the Anthropocene. It deals with the future. It deals with the now, the present crisis. And over the course of the semester, 
it goes back in time. Uh, so why, like, isn't that isn't that a crazy way to do history backwards? Who thinks that's a little crazy? Okay. Um, so <coughs> let's test let's test uh, two different modes of doing this course. Here's here's the um, if we go way back in time. Uh, what does it feel like to give and receive that lecture of the dawn of time to the present of that version of the course? So pay attention what happens to your body. Pay attention what happens to your mind. Pay attention to what what happens to you uh, when I start teaching at you about the dawn of time and uh, human history. I'm just going to do this for this is a like a two-minute sample of the lecture uh, that I used to give at the beginning of the semester, right? And I, I'm proud of it. I, I, I work really hard to do a good job at this, but there's something that's that happens to the entire room when we start with the dawn of history. So here we go. Uh, Something around four and a half billion years ago, the Big Bang produced the universe as we know it. And in the first few nanoseconds of the Big Bang, it produced all of the core elements and the energy was released and expanded uh, at light speed and uh, over the course of the next several billion years, the planets, the stars, the asteroids, the dust, all came into being in the universe. The Earth is a gravitational clump of matter that by some bizarre fluke uh, evolved to the point where the chemical material elements of the planet made it possible for the emergence of bacteria and primitive life forms. And eventually uh, the uh, the oceans and the continents uh, took shape as we know them, and those life forms got increasingly complex. And if we look at the uh, timeline, uh, I'm going to do another little graph. If we look at the timeline from the Big Bang to the emergence of humans. I'm not sure I can draw a line. If we're doing it to scale, human presence. Uh, is in, in those last few millimeters of this line. It's a remarkably compressed history. And in an equally, and then now if you expand this time dimension, if we blow that up to be, you know, if we move that down and change the scale, and this is the history of human existence, of humans as we know it, homo sapiens. This is the dawn of agriculture, somewhere around here. This is uh, the birth of Christ and the Industrial Revolution and everything. So um, we have to then blow that up in order to look at the time scale we're talking about. So it's a pretty impressive a sense of scale. Um, and so the, the portion of the history of the universe that we are dealing with here is a tiny slice of a tiny slice of a, a much larger thing. Um, around 10,000 years ago, humans started to specialize and uh, instead of everyone uh, gathering food for their, the sustenance of their family groups. Um, some people started to specialize and take on different roles. That was only possible because food gathering became more and more efficient and productive. And with that specialization came the formation of uh, village communities that uh, were different members of that community, took on different purposes and functions. And uh, those different, and within those communities, 
a hierarchy of social order and purpose, and you start to get uh, chiefs and uh, a hierarchy of power within each village. Now, humans uh, emerged out of Africa and uh, spread across the planet over a long period of time uh, and only very recently arrived in uh, the Americas um, and even more recently in the island nations of the Pacific. So basically, it's a very rapid expansion out. Uh, and so you get a sense of what it means to go back in history. We talk about um, the formation of minerals that became useful as tools, the first cities, the first um, urban settlements, uh, Chatal Huyuk, um, etc. So that's interesting, right? But did you notice what happened? What happened to you? How did it feel? To go back to four point. Felt kind of unnecessary to go back that far. Like I feel like ten thousand years ago would be like good to like start. Yeah. Rather than like at the like, beginning of time. Okay. That just be though. Okay, but still, when we got even when we got to ten thousand years ago, are you saying that okay now okay I can relate to that ten thousand years ago now we're talking about me, right? Did you feel that? I mean, it felt like it felt like a bit more prevalent to me as like someone who's learning about architecture. Like people start to specialize. Okay, so maybe they start building buildings now. Yes, and there they are. They're the buildings. So yeah, it starts to get interesting. But still, what does this have to do with me? What does that have to do with you? Like, can you? Do you? Is this worth studying? Like, why do we even study this? What's the point of knowing about this? Should we study this? I think we should, but it's not clear to me when we start at the beginning, why? Like all of a sudden I started to get pissed off about my education. It's like, uh, wait a minute, there's an awful lot of stuff that I memorized and I took on that uh, was not just uh, useless, it was actually harmful. It actually gave me a sense of, of the natural order of human progress that actually uh, undermined my ability to critically evaluate uh, the order of things as maybe it's not natural, maybe it's uh, something that should be questioned. So my ability to question as a student, I look back on my education in this mode, my ability to question is knocked, my, my questioning legs are knocked out from under me because what's the basis for questioning any of this? It's all just given knowledge. There's no, there's no engagement, there's no active. I have, as a student, I have no expertise uh, on this and uh, there's no basis for me to engage this material. What if there was an ethical obligation of schools to not push students into a passive reception mode of receiving given knowledge? For example, you've probably all seen this, but I think it's worth reminding us about it. You've seen this? How do you get it to play? You've seen this, right? I wasn't taught how to get a job, but I can remember dissecting remember a frog. I wasn't taught how to pay tax, but I know loads about Shakespeare's classics. I was never taught how to vote. They devoted that time to defining isotopes. I wasn't taught how to look after my health, but mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Never spent a lesson on current events. Instead, I studied the old American West. I was never taught what laws there are. I was never taught what laws there are. Let me repeat, I was not taught the laws for the country I live in. But I know how Henry VIII killed his women. Divorce, beheaded, died. Divorce, beheaded, survived. Glad that's in my head instead of financial advice. I was shown the wavelengths of different hues of light. But I was never taught my human rights. Apparently, there's 30. Do you know them? I don't. What the hell? Can't we both recite them by what I know? Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Yet I don't know squat about trading stocks or how money works. So 
I was too busy then rehearsing cuss It didn't learn how much it cost to raise a kid And what an affidavit is But I spent days on what the quadratic equation is I get to B plus or minus the square root To B squared minus 4AC over 2A That's insane, that's absolutely insane They made me learn facts over basic first aid Or how to recognise the most deadly mental disorders Or diseases with preventable causes Or how to buy a house with a mortgage If I could afford it Cause abstract maths was deemed more important Than advice that would literally save thousands of lives But it's cool Cause now I can tell you if the number of unnecessary deaths Caused by that choice was prime Never taught present day practical medicines But I was told what the ancient Hippocratic method is I've got a headache, the pain is ceaseless What should I take? Um, maybe try some leeches? Could we discuss domestic abuse and get the facts? Or how to help my depressed friend with a mental state? Um, no, but learn mental maths Because you won't have a calculator with you every day They say it's not the kids, the parents are the problem Then if you taught the kids to parent, that's the problem solved then All this advice about using a condom But not for when you actually have a kid when you want one I'm only fluent in this language For serious, the rest of the world speaks too Do you think I'm an idiot? He chose the solo over the political system So like a typical citizen Now I don't know what I'm voting on Which policies exist or how to make them change me We use and put the français so at 18 I was expected to elect a representative for a system I have never ever ever been presented with But I won't take it, I'll tell everyone my childhood was wasted I'll share it everywhere how I was educated And insist these pointless things don't stay in school Wait, wait, don't look at that part <laughs> You've seen that, right? <laughs> Who's seen that before? <laughs> Really? So you, I, my kids are all about this. They taught me this. So, what do you think of that? It makes sense. Does that strike a chord? So, am I encouraging you to leave the room at this point? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually very optimistic about uh, the power. I'm so op I'm the most optimistic person you will ever meet about the power of education. Uh, but I am very. I'm, I have a healthy skepticism for the ability of your school to do the job on its own. Thus, my graph at the beginning of the class. So. Um, being exposed to this uh, because of uh, the children that are now young adults who I grew up with, um, I, I can't teach the way I used to teach. I have to change the way I teach as an ethical and professional obligation, not just to myself and not just to you, but to the world. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm not doing this just for you. I am doing it for you. But I'm also doing it out of a sense of obligation to doing a better job and preparing you to take leadership positions in the world and make a real difference. So instead of disempowering you right away from the get-go by teaching you about things that happened uh, we start with Glombos Caves 60,000 years ago, and then move up to Chat al Huyuk at 10,000 years ago, and then up through Egypt, Rome, uh, through the history of cities uh, throughout time. Let's instead take a fresh look at history. This whole idea that this is not a history course, this is a history theory course. And the two courses you had before this, supposedly, the ambition, the aspiration, is that those are also history hyphen theory courses where it's not just, here are the facts of, of the events that happened over time. Instead, it's uh, let's look at the course of human history and the forces driving human history. Let's look at them through a lens and through a, uh, an ability to analyze those forces in a way that actually helps us face the challenges of our careers, right? This is a professional program. How, how can we justify uh, all this time spent in the classroom learning history? Well, I can justify it. If the way you do history, and I 
choosing those words very carefully. You are learning to do history. You are producing new histories out of the historical record. You are constructing an understanding of the forces that operate in the world right now uh, that are impacting your lives. Again, you are the world's foremost experts, not just on your own life experience, but the forces that are operating through your life experience. And by understanding those forces, uh, the housing crisis that you're going to try to uh, navigate, uh, student loan debt, higher education, getting a job in the architecture profession, those, your expertise in those forces, your experience with those forces, are powerful instruments for looking at human history uh, in great detail to understand things and to, to reveal things that uh, people before you have not revealed properly. So, uh, like I said last summer, uh, I am using the history theory course to enlist you in the project of examining human history in a way that can reveal things for yourselves, for me, and for uh, our uh, colleagues out there in the world. We cannot afford to reproduce the stories of human history the same old way. I'm going to present to you um, some histories in this course, the histories of cities. And it's going to overlap significantly with the time-honored tradition of teaching of the history of cities. But that's not enough. It's not enough for you to simply take it in. You actually have to actively engage it and adjust and refine, revise, you verify whether something is true or not and correct those histories where they need correcting. And that's what professionals do. And then based on that corrected understanding of the forces of human history, you then design and implement action in the world. And nobody does that as uh, with greater impact, I believe, than architects and planners. We actually have an enormous impact on how the world is structured for everybody else. And I'm using that word structured very carefully. We are all conditioned throughout our lifetimes by the structures we inhabit. We know who the losers and the winners are in our society because we know that losers are standing at the side of the street waiting for the bus. And the winners are driving those big black SUVs with tinted glass, or better yet, sitting in the back, right? How do we know that? The world is structured to give us that message. Every day, day in, day out, uh, those messages are reinforced for us. And that is a product of the design and construction of the built environment. And we cannot afford, as in the world cannot afford, another generation of architects who believe that it's their job, that it's our job, to simply execute the orders of the commanders of society. We actually have to gently but firmly and steadfastly offer options that they have never seen before, where they can protect their interests and profits uh, without victimizing the majority of the human race. And that's uh, an ethical obligation of the profession. And so in order to empower the profession of architecture to do, to, to tackle that that job m more head on and not just as a, a side note, but straight on, that is the job of the architect. Uh, the history must begin from an honest and blunt evaluation of the forces that have put us in the situation 
that you are facing in your lifetimes in your careers. That's the working hypothesis of the course. Questions? We okay with that? <coughs> so you'll let me know along the way, please, uh, how <coughs> we can do that better, or if there's a problem with this, uh, this experiment in how to teach history of cities, um, I would greatly appreciate it. So you recognize this. This is that lecture. The last lecture of that last history theory course, um, there was a lot of stuff that we breezed through that I want to go back and cover. And uh, also, uh, there were a few things um, that we need to do to prepare you for the challenges you face uh, every week from Friday to Wednesday. And then uh, if you spent two hours on this course between uh, Wednesday and Friday, let's see, it's a four credit course. How does this work? Help me out. Four credit course. <coughs> So how much time should I be spending outside of class altogether? 16? No, that's too many. Eight? Yeah, eight's good. It's a good target, you know, plus or minus. Uh, so we've, we've expended two, so that gives us six. Um, does that sound right? And you have two days to do the two, and you have five days to do the six. Is that okay? Um, it should be five. Yeah, yeah you could. Well, not minus five. But that's a range. That's not a minus sign. That's a range. How about that? Zero. No, that's a range. Five, five to seven. All of a sudden, you're good at math. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do that um, after a quick little drop into the Anthropocene part. The Anthropocene part of this lecture, I don't know if you remember, it was pretty quick. So let's, let's do that. Do you remember this lecture? Do you remember this course? Hmm. We did the reflex, uh, we did this reflexive verb thing, cause and effect. Remember cause and effect? Yeah. That was cool, cause and effect. You guys really struggled with the chicken and egg thing. Some of you were really convinced that there was a right answer. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Raise your hand if you say egg. Raise your hand if you say chicken. Egg would die without the mother's Egg was a genetic mutation. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm sure you're correct, but for the purposes of this point, let's just treat it like um, there's a mutual relationship between egg and chicken, that it goes on endlessly forever. I mean, maybe at some point, you know, there is a God, and God just said, chicken! Or God just said, hey, right? Maybe that happened, we don't know. But what is observable in human experience is that chickens come from eggs and eggs come from chicken in an endless infinite sequence and it is a pointless exercise to choose arbitrarily one or the other. Unless you're trying to understand processes, in which case it is useful to look at the chicken and understand how the egg comes out of that damn chicken. How did that happen? Or to isolate a segment of this endless chain and look at the egg and see how a chicken emerges out of an egg. It's a miracle. It's worth looking at. But please don't ignore the fact that this is an arbitrary segment of an endless string. And my reason for bringing this up last summer was that a critique of history, and especially the history that we learned of the 20th century and the way 
professional architects treated history in the 20th century is as it, it <coughs> ignored that longer chain of causal uh, relationships, especially when we get to Bilbao, right? The Bilbao effect is this false belief that Frank Gehry came to this decrepit industrial hellhole of Bilbao, Spain, built his beautiful piece of architecture, and all of a sudden, the city emerged as this glorious, uh, triumphant, uh, wiz uh, Wizard of Oz, Land of Oz type thing. No, Frank Gehry came in very late in the game and added a cherry on top of the ice cream sundae that was Bilbao. The transformation of Bilbao was the product of political, economic, uh, governance, warfare, all of these historic forces, the transformation of the university system and the harbor, et cetera. And the architecture is both a product of that revolution and a further amplification and boosting of the process that continues. So did Frank Gehry's Bilbao uh, Guggenheim Museum improve the conditions of Bilbao? Absolutely. But it was part of a much longer string of cause and effect, cause and effect sequences that continue to the present. Is that okay? Anybody going to question the evidence of that premise? And based on that, it helps us see the operation of these reflexive mechanisms. The biggest and most famous one is um, the operation of markets, supply and demand. And we had the, um, remember this? You remember this. Um, do you remember the tragedy of the commons? Mm -hmm. Basically, um, three of us each have three sheep, and we have a shared pasture. It's the commons. And there's a commons right over there in, the, in Boston Common. I don't know if you can put sheep on there anymore. They might have changed the laws. But if there were three of us with three sheep, and every, all the sheep are healthy and happy, if I get greedy and I add a fourth sheep, and now, I over, now we're overgrazing, and the grass is dying, and it's getting muddy, and uh, the, the health and well-being of all the sheep goes down. But I'm still, that's me, I'm still getting the additional profit of that fourth sheep. So we're all suffering, but I'm doing it anyway because I'm going to get more money. So that's the tragedy of the commons. Uh, and that is uh, a, a game theory model for why the planet uh, must die. It's inevitable. But it's a false, it's a false premise. What's going to happen in real life, these two guys are going to say, Robert, be reasonable, uh, or we'll stop hanging out with you, and we'll talk bad behind your back. And so I am an actor in a social community, and I am subjected to the social influence and forces uh, of my, my good friends, of the society I live in. So this model is based on a false premise. This is an unrealistic thing. There's never going to be a case where these three actors don't talk to each other, uh, which is a premise of, of this tragedy of the commons. There's one exception to that, though. Our modern economic system has made it so that we can't talk to each other. And so we have artificially constructed a global economic order in which the conditions, the bizarre conditions of the tragedy of the commons, against all odds, have been constructed. Uh, these companies can only talk to each other enough to collaborate, to uh, accelerate the, the speed with which the carrying capacity of the planet is exhausted. Um, when I was growing up, uh, <laughs> the last millennium, I knew with absolute certainty that governments would address the, uh, the environmental crisis because 
throughout human history, that's what governments did. When, uh, when children were dying of disease, uh, the government uh, funded research and hospitals and doctors and they dealt with the problem. And of course, you know, pollution is the same thing. But then a very, very weird thing happened is that governments actually undermined the ability of those forces that would naturally uh, correct the overreach of a business and they eliminated the capacity for governments and uh, economies to correct those forces. And so rather than creating uh, an economic incentive to not do harm, the government prevented that from happening and subsidized uh, businesses that do harm and protected them from any um, consequences for depleting uh, the resources or dumping their garbage into the atmosphere, the oceans, and the earth. So it's a very strange episode in human history that uh, caused this. And um, that's the only reason why we're facing this Anthropocene crisis. It's something that was constructed. It's something that was done by professionals like the people who came before us, and including architects and planners. Uh, against that, a hundred cities around the world have embraced uh, the, the common pool resource models uh, offered by Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom uh, as a governance and economic mechanism for creating incentives for uh, de reducing the amount of environmental depletion. Uh, one of the key mechanisms is putting a price on carbon. And by putting a price on carbon, you can actually harness market forces and the uh, profit incentive to reduce uh, the amount of carbon. Uh, it's a very interesting system. And to the extent that architects uh, produce and analyze, they analyze systems, they produce systems, there's a lot of built uh, component, built environment components to all systems, including this one, uh, that this is a system that is designed. It's designed in the way architecture is designed with inputs and outputs and consequences and criteria, the same as any design problem. Uh, and this is a system that has been designed. If the political mechanisms permit it to be implemented, it does hold promise to reverse the incentive system of capitalism. Is capitalism a horrible thing? Raise your hand, capitalism is horrible. Um, raise your hand, capitalism is wonderful. Raise your hand, so what is, what's the truth? Capitalism is a tool? It's what? Or is it a very powerful tool? for doing harm or good. Yeah. How about that? Very powerful tool for doing harm or good. Yeah, it's kind of as, I don't know who the rap guy, what's his name? The rap singer? Yeah. You've never seen him? I expected you to school me on the guy's name. Okay. Just as he said, these are the economy uh, love it or hate it, what are you going to do? It, it, it pushes us and pulls us in ways that it's not, it, that's not going to go away. We're not going to tear down, tear down the system and impose a utopian garden community. I'd probably not. We're probably not going to tear down capitalism. So is there a way to harness capitalism as a tool Instead of for great evil, can we harness it for great good? Back to Star Wars, right? It's, it's a Star Wars analogy. Right, we did this. Right? Remember that? So economic value of architecture and how is it produced? How is the economic value of architecture <coughs> produced? Is it 
Like, I like my house. I would pay money for my house. But I, God knows, I could never afford to pay the money my house is worth now. I bought my house uh, back in the 20th century when the price was much lower, you know, one third of what it is now. I couldn't afford my house now. I really like it. The house is, comp uh, the cost of housing is composed of two components. And this is an important concept, use value and exchange value. The use value of the rent you pay in the dorms or on Mission Hill or wherever is a fraction of the rent you pay. So the use, the, the rent you pay is the exchange value plus the use value. And um, the exchange value, every time, see that, that third tower on the Boston skyline? You see that? So um, people own those people own those condos, those expensive condos, but they don't live in them. There are no lights on at night. Maybe it's not complete, but maybe it is complete. But I predict two, three, four years from now, uh, it will be 100% owned and not 100% lit up at night. And this is a graphic. Uh, some architectural researchers have been looking at utility bills because real estate uh, building owners do not report on how many people are living in their buildings. They suppress that information. That is top secret. It's true in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, London, Paris, New York, Boston. Uh, we're not going to tell you how many people are actually living there. We're just going to tell you how many people, how many apartments are owned. So 100% are owned, but hardly anyone living there. There's no lights on, right? And so they look at utility bills, and one architect has coined the term necropolis. It's a city that is dead because nobody lives there. The only thing that these apartments are doing is they are diversify, diversifying the financial portfolios of very wealthy people from all over the world. And they'd love to invest in Boston because Boston uh, looks really good from an investment point of view. It's got all this university, medical, financial uh, stability as an economy. And so it's a good place to park some money into real estate as a strategy for diversifying. If you have $10 million, um, about a third of it you should invest in real estate and in places like Boston, and why not in that new tower? Um, but every time someone buys one of those condo towers, you will see, you might notice it, you might not notice it, but the exchange value of your rent, the exchange value component of your rent is gonna go up. And that's true even if you live in a, a dorm at Wentworth. Wentworth is charging market rates for its dorm housing. So this is part of your world. These, this is one of those forces that you are dealing with already. And the whole world is dealing with it. You wanna, if you want to do something about gentrification, uh, you better understand how these things work, first and foremost. And so Dubai is one giant financial uh, investment magnet machine. No one wants to live in Dubai. There's nothing in Dubai. There's not even water. They have to boil thousands of gallons of seawater every day using uh, natural gas and oil uh, just to send potable water through its pipes to uh, bizarrely attempt to maintain a standard that we take for granted in North America. Um, there's, it's, a, it's, it's a hollow system. And the way they boost and maintain the financial value of all of that condo property in the Burj Khalifa is by staging these spectacles once a year to make it a thing that might possibly still have value 10 years from now. No one ever has to live there. Uh, they just have to uh, be convinced that uh, a $1 million apartment uh, today will be worth something like $1 million or more 10 years from now. That's all they have to do. 
There's, uh, there's no reason to go up. It's a desert. There's lots, there's lots and lots of land. There's no shortage of land. This is a bizarre aberration of architecture. So this is the part we skipped over. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, kind just like a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly 100 times that of the poorest Americans and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top two to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 
1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9% meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. So this was produced based on data from 10 years ago, and it's gotten worse. Uh, and the United States is one of the wealthiest countries in the world with a very healthy, relative uh, democratic system. So what does it look like when we look at the whole planet? Let me see if this works. People are talking a lot about inequality these days, about the fact that the richest 1% have so much more than everybody else. But most of the focus seems to be on the United States. And it strikes me that the same story needs to be told about global inequality, too. So I did some research, and this is what I found from reliable sources like the UN. It turns out that while the US is totally out of whack, things are actually way worse for the planet as a whole. Let's start with this graph. A perfectly even distribution of wealth among all living people, with everyone divided into five equal groups. Now, let's show how much each group actually has. Shocking, right? 80% of the world's people barely have any wealth. It's hard to even see them on the chart. Meanwhile, the richest 2%, they have more wealth than half of the rest of the world. Let's look at this chart another way. Let's take the whole world's population, all 7 billion of us, and reduce it to just a representative 100 individuals. Here they are, poorest people on the left, richest people on the right. Now let's show how the world's total wealth Roughly $223 trillion is distributed. The vast majority have practically nothing. <coughs> nothing with which to educate their children, nothing of which to pay for basic medicines. While the richest 1%, they've accumulated 43% of our world's wealth. The bottom 80%, meanwhile, that's 8 out of every 10 people, have just 6% between them. But even this doesn't really show how extreme things have become. The richest 300 people on Earth have the same wealth as the poorest 3 billion. So the number of people it takes to fill a mid-sized commercial aircraft have more <coughs> wealth than the populations of India, China, the US, and Brazil combined. We can also see this difference geographically, with a huge and growing gap between a few rich places versus the majority of the world. For most of history, things were much more equal. 200 years ago, rich countries were only three times richer than poor countries. By the end of colonialism in the 1960s, they were 35 times richer. Today, they're about 80 times richer. Rich countries try to compensate for this by giving aid to poor countries, about $130 billion each year. That's a lot of money. So then why does the wealth gap keep getting bigger? One reason I found is that large corporations are taking more than $900 billion out of poor countries each year through a form of tax avoidance called trade mispricing. On top of this, each year poor countries are paying about $600 billion in debt service to rich countries on loans that have already been paid off many times over. And then there's the money that poor countries lose from trade rules imposed by rich countries to get access to more resources and cheaper labor. 
Economists from the University of Massachusetts calculate that this costs poor countries about $500 billion a year. Altogether, that's more than $2 trillion that flows from some of the poorest parts of the world to the richest every year. Rich governments like to say they're helping poor countries develop, but who's developing who here? This makes me think that there's something wrong with the basic rule of the global economy. It can't be okay that the wealth of our planet is becoming so concentrated in the hands of such a tiny number of people. The only reasonable response, it seems to me, and our only hope, is to change the rules. So, given the uh, starkness of that situation of wealth distribution, uh, what does, how does that help us understand the uh, cascading uh, climate change impacts? And it's this, um, it's this image that uh, I think is worth looking at. These are the nine sectors of planetary imbalance uh, that threaten uh, the, the systems, the planetary systems. And it's interesting to note that ozone depletion uh, 20 years ago was looked something like this. But um, it was the last moment of sane action that took place. And it actually grew from here out to here. And then because the international community collaborated uh, to take action, we're back into the safe operating uh, space of this in terms of ozone depletion. So uh, we know what to do. We have the ability to do it. What is keeping us from doing it? The answer uh, is not the technical solutions. We have all the technical solutions as I presented in the lecture last summer. The answer is our human mechanisms are the larger systemic decision-making processes are distorted and uh, swayed against uh, self-preservation as uh, a species. And so um, one of the hopes, uh, one of the ambitions of this course, remember the population stuff? One of the ambitions of this course is to actually develop the skills to analyze systems <coughs> and how they uh, manifest as built physical systems and uh, to understand how things are working and to use that understanding to propose measures of the through the built environment and the associated institutional arrangements to open up the possibility of uh, moving in the right direction and so that's where we got into looking at the success of Singapore in the face of crisis to dramatically transform the built environment as part of a much larger effort to transform the society with great success. And uh, remember this slide, it's not so much the pollution or the population or the flooding or the food or the housing, transportation, crime, or anything else you want to list. <coughs> On their own, we know how to solve each of these problems, and it's architects who are part of that solution. But what prevents us from tackling this effectively is uh, the fear of uh, the powerful and wealthy that they're somehow going to be um, lose out uh, in the context of systemic inequality. It's not so much a problem of greed, it's a problem of fear of uh, reprisal and violence uh, that creates these walled enclaves and these uh, bubbles of privilege. Uh, this kind of a situation, there's no way that this physical, spatial, institutional arrangement cannot uh, uh, be a source of antagonism, anxiety, fear, and potential violence. Uh, this is an actual place in Brazil. Um, instead, 
mayors, uh, architects who became mayors, like in Curitiba, have transformed their communities in part using the physical, uh, the design of physical infrastructure and arrangements. And the most dramatic example yet, I believe, is Medellin, Colombia. Which, and um, here's the, the architect of the Medellin miracle presenting in Watson Hall uh, a month after he stepped down from being mayor of Medellin, Colombia. So this is something that we are involved in here at Wentworth. Um, and so let's look at, uh, in the last 10 minutes, um, what then must we do, right? How are we going to uh, proceed in this course uh, to, in the light of what we're talking about here? These enormous challenges that seem uh, not just beyond hope, but certainly beyond the scope of what architects do. Well, um, the working hypothesis of this course is that while some of these issues truly are beyond the scope of architecture, uh, architecture infuses all systems and all human or institutional arrangements have a spatial formal manifestation as part of the, the operating system of these larger systems. Just as we saw Burj Khalifa, a piece of architecture, at the core of a global financial system that is way out of balance. Uh, that is true all over the place, wherever we look. And um, our job, as in your job, is to find pieces of the world, look at them in a way that allows us to access Uh, the possibilities for change. Now the history of this course, uh, we, we used to look at, this is a mode of analysis that was produced in 1746 by Noli in his drawing of a figure ground plan of the center of Rome. Uh, and he did a radical thing he distinguished between the private interior spaces of the blocks versus the publicly accessible spaces of the churches. So here you see the Pantheon, uh, you see some of the famous churches of Rome, uh, and all of a sudden it reveals the porosity of the fabric of the city. So this is called the Noli map method of drawing, and it reveals remarkable things about uh, the architecture of cities. So treating city fragments as architecture is the first and foremost mission of this assignment between now and Wednesday. Uh, this is a diagram of the Garden City of Ebenezer Howard. Uh, and it's a powerful diagram, but it lacks the immediacy and impact of architecture. And so we look at actual architecture. Corbusier's Ville Radieuse, we studied that. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, we studied that. Uh, Kevin Lynch's mental mapping of Boston, he interviewed people, uh, asking them what they remember, and then he asked them to draw Boston from memory before Google Maps. And he compiled uh, all of those mental maps together and produced a remarkable uh, set of insights about the things that people use to mentally navigate through the city. Uh, nodes, edges, districts, landmarks, and um, something else. The transect, uh, cutting through the fabric to create uh, a type, a typology of urban form. Uh, the racial, the more recent mapping technologies that uh, identify race uh, distributions. Uh, and then Weldon Priest, who taught at Wentworth for 40 years and did more than anybody I've ever seen to advance the ability uh, for architects to represent fragments of the city as meaningful architectural uh, formations. 
And so this course emerges out of this, all of this background, in, including and perhaps especially um, the work of Weldon Priest, uh, who I had the pleasure of co-teaching with. Now, in the analysis assignment, so you did, you've done a lot of analysis work last summer, remember that? Where the core of the task was to take a piece of, of architecture and draw it in a way that reveals and amplifies the architectural impact of certain features. And that was done uh, largely with tracing of pencil on top of uh, photos or other things. This semester, we're moving to this, from the scale of architecture to the scale of cities. And remember what happened when you got too diagrammatic in your analysis? What happened when, when you got too diagrammatic? Uh, you got a five. You got a five, exactly. Um, diagrams, why are diagrams uh, inadequate to the task? It's because we're trying to understand how architecture actually does what it does. What does architecture do and how does it do it? A diagram is an assertion that transcends actual architectural effects. It doesn't <coughs> replicate those architectural effects. Similarly, plans and aerial views that are too far away do not do the job. This is not OK. This is not OK. This is better because it's closer up. But the view from straight overhead uh, leaves much to be desired. You can't really uh, access the architectural scale human experience of the place. And that is an important aspect. Uh, looking at the Forbidden City in China, the map, too diagrammatic. The aerial view, too abstracted. I can't get access, none of us can get access to the human scale experience. Better diagrams, a little bit of axon, and a little bit of shadow and depth, I'm starting to get more and more in touch. But the view from straight up and down, not good enough. Not good enough. The colored shapes uh, are obscuring, they're, they're preventing us from accessing the data on the ground. Don't use opaque uh, colored shapes. They need to be transparent enough so that your readers are invited to uh, check for themselves, to look at the underlying fabric of the place to verify whether or not it is actually happening. This is better because we can start to see, but still, no matter what we do, if we're looking at it from straight overhead, not quite grasping the architectural scale human experience on the ground. So instead, oblique views, but exploded views not good enough. This is better, but it's more of a a model, so we don't trust the data. This is much better. The oblique view that allows us to see the humans using the space, but again, this is too opaque, and uh, the actual factual reality <coughs> of the data underlying the abstraction is, is hard to access. And these lines are too, uh, don't use the polyline tools. Now we're talking, I'm not even sure the color has been changed, but I look at it and say, yeah, the color has been changed. It's being used to highlight the open space unused between the Corbusier style towers in the park. Um, so this is a much more subtle and much more effective use of the tools um, so that the pixel for pixel I'm capturing. Maybe it was the magic wand tool. Do you guys know how to use Adobe Photoshop? Mm. Adobe Photoshop turns out to be the most powerful tool for accessing and attempting these exercises. This is a great oblique view. We have access. Most perspectives give us access to something recognizably human scale and experiential in the foreground while setting the context of the larger urban system in the background. So remember that. Foreground, 
We want architectural scale, human experience, in the context of the larger pattern of human uh, urban uh, patterns of, of construction. Um, Mecca, uh, the Qibla, um, the, during the Hajj, very interesting uh, situation where it's a little far away, but we recognize those as human figures in the foreground. Uh, one of the tricks is to kind of soften the tone of the surrounding fabric and then punch out, uh, give full saturation of the color uh, to the thing we want to look at. Here is they took away the color um, so that our eye is drawn to um, Cooper's <coughs> Village in New York City, uh, the public housing. Similarly, uh, using uh, transparent overlays to highlight the highway infrastructure, the areas around it. Uh, this is a very effective way to proceed. Um, and then the, the video. <coughs> Thus giving the mosque the central position. Islamic principles maintain a clean and natural environment with the social environment. That's why mosque is surrounded by public places and garden areas. Uh, can't hear it. Damascus is an Islamic city and the capital of Syria. It is one of the largest cities in the area. The city has multiple mosques and is developed around a system of roads running through rather than developed around a main central mosque. Within the zones created by the main roads, the urban environment still follows the same pattern of most Islamic cities. There are multiple huge mosques with central courtyards, while the private homes have internal courtyards as well. The main avenues are compliant with the mosque's need to... So this is wrong the in the, the idea is that you centralize one image to the and that area. one image is the Smaller one thing you analyze. You can add other images Syria, to support it, but those other images cannot be more than one-third of your 60-second video. So this is not really complying with the rules. Let's see if we can look at something very different. I'm not sure why all of these are from the Islamic City Week. Let's see what this one is. Istanbul has a deep history with Muslims. Well, that's not a very good image. So, questions? How did they make a video? What is it? How did they make a video? Um, how do you make a video? iMovie. What is it? iMovie. iMovie? Are there easier ways to do it? And record your screen. What? Record your screen. Record your screen? Yeah. What do you, software do you use Quick for that? Time. Quick time? Yeah, it's a whole bunch. Built into your computer if you have a Mac. Yeah, so I can, um, as, so step one, first of all, all of the instructions in, in very great detail are in the syllabus for the assignment that's due on uh, Wednesday. Um, so work with those. Uh, Step one is to choose an image. Uh, this week, the topic is the Anthropocene. Other students before you have chosen things like uh, Hurricane Katrina. Again, elevated views that are looking at uh, the landscape. Hurricane Sandy in New York. Uh, if you find a high resolution uh, image that has architectural scale human experience in the foreground, the larger pattern of urban formation in the background, you can then start to overlay uh, these colored uh, overlays with transparency so to start to reveal the relationships between the forms, the spaces, and the institutions. 
So these are formal spatial institutional relationships. And then basically it's the 120 word argument exercise that you guys are all expert at at this point. And you are constructing, you're using the visual evidence that comes out of your analysis to construct a point by point argument uh, where the insight occurs as you write and then goes as the first sentence of your argument. And then you record that and capture on screen the different stages of your analysis process. Questions? Yes? Google Earth uh, is a great example of uh, what we used to do and no longer do because it doesn't work so well. These, uh, these aerial views just uh, don't cut it. Well, you can get like... Street view. Not street view, like kind of aerial, not aerial like directly. Right. Hit, like. How about this? How about Bing Maps? Do you know about Bing Maps? It's not called Bing Maps anymore. What is it called? Unlike Google Earth, Bing Maps, or whatever it's called now, I think Microsoft purchased them, they take oblique views from four directions. Bing Maps, yes. Google Maps, no. Google Earth, no. I don't recommend Google Earth. I could be proven wrong. I'm very interested to see what you're able to do. But it, the only three-dimensional uh, quality comes with the digital models, the SketchUp models that they place. It, it's generally inadequate to the task. Other questions? Okay, if you have questions, email me uh, and I'll um, try to respond. Thank you, everyone. Thank uh you. -huh.